Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Leon Hartwell. Welcome to the Russia-Ukraine Dialogues. Today marks day 90, not of the Russia-Ukraine war, as some media outlets incorrectly refer to it, but, the, but day 90 of the rapid escalation of Putin's aggression in Ukraine. The war more accurate, accurately started when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. The February escalation has so far caused the displacement of over 14 million Ukrainians, and the conflict shows no sign of abating. Ladies and gentlemen, today's Russia-Ukraine dialogue will focus on the road to NATO for Sweden and Finland. In recent months, these two countries have both made a 180-degree turn in terms of their positions on non-military alignment. For Finland and Sweden, the desire to join NATO undoubtedly directly relates to Putin's aggression in Ukraine. At the same time, Finland and Sweden's decision will have major implications, not only with regards to their relations with NATO member states, but also with Russia. To discuss those issues, I would like to welcome two very distinguished panelists. Firstly, I'd like to uh, welcome Ambassador Yuka Siokosari. Finland's head of mission to the UK and Northern Ireland. He is a veteran diplomat who has served his country in a variety of roles, including as the head of cabinet of President Sali Neonisti. And he was ambassador to Buenos Aires and Tokyo. My second panelist is also very distinguished, the Honorable Karen Enstrom, a member of the Swedish parliament representing the moderate party. She is also chair of the Swedish delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and she has served her country in a variety of positions related to defense and foreign affairs, including as Sweden's Minister of Defense. Welcome to both of you. I will first uh, turn to you, Ambassador. Um, now, Russia invaded Georgia in August 2008 and Ukraine in 2014. Following the February 2022 escalation, of the Russia-Ukraine war, there was a sudden surge in Finland to be part of NATO. Why did this happen now and how significant is this? Thank you, Ambassador. I think, yeah, we, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Maybe uh, we will turn to you, Karen, uh, and then we'll, We'll circle back. Uh, we'll circle back. No, still nothing. All right, Karan, why don't I ask you uh, a related question to this? Um, now, during your time as Minister of Defense, Sweden began to take a number of steps to enhance its security following Putin's invasion of Ukraine in 2014. What were those steps? And importantly, what are the major differences in terms of Sweden's reading of Russians' actions in 2014 and, and uh, in Ukraine versus the February 2022 escalation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I would like to start with the situation in, uh, in March, February, March 2014. Uh, I mean, we, we had seen what happened in 2008 in Georgia. And I think at that time, many of us saw that as a, well, a bump, bump in the road. But actually, we saw then from 2012, 2013, that uh, something was going on. And then in, in the spring of 2014, we had already started to well, deepen our relationship to NATO. Uh, I would say cl quite closely together with Finland, we uh, had become... Um, well, enhanced opportunities partners or, or as partners in the enhanced opportunities program. We also looked into the possibilities to, to train e more with uh, NATO and NATO uh, allies. We started the process of getting into the, the, um, the host nation support agreement with NATO. It wasn't ratified at that time, but we started the process in, in 2014. We also started the process of enhancing uh, our uh, defense budget. Uh, we, as uh, the government um, proposed 
5 billion Swedish crowns uh, at that time uh, in late um, well, May, June in 2014. And that was a remarkable amount of money at that time. We haven't seen many, well, many new money to, to the to defense budget for, for quite some years. Uh, and I also, when I was a minister and this happened, I gave the defense commission who were uh, analyzing, well, analyzing and preparing a report for our next uh, defense bill. I gave them more time so that they could from what happened, learn from what happened and analyze the new situation. Uh, so I gave them more time to, to, to come and present their report. And I think from that time on, uh, we have been in, well, in government and then in opposition, but together with the government, trying to increase our defense capabilities and also deepening our cooperation with both NATO, um, respective NATO allies, but also with the Nordic countries and especially with, uh, with Finland. And um, I started, uh, well, we have always been cooperating and working together very closely, but in, in the, during the autumn 2013, uh, with my colleague at that time, uh, Mr. Haglund, who was Defense Minister in Finland, we started to prepare a deepened uh, defense cooperation. But not just on defense, but also contacts between between the the, the two respective uh, ministries uh, of both of foreign affairs and and the Ministry of Defense. So I think that was quite a like a well, starting point for our deep cooperation. So you also asked what is the the main differences from twenty fourteen as we took this really serious, and now what happened this year? Well, I. My my feeling and my perception is that this was uh, so much bigger, and also in a context where uh, Russia started uh, in a the fall to start to really, I would say, challenge the whole European security order, uh, and with the, their demands, and also that they demanded they wanted like written. Uh, written answers, written treaties, a written agreement from, from, from NATO and NATO countries. And also, I mean, writing letters to the whole OSSE, uh, uh, well, group of, of member states. Uh, that was something new. They were like more assertive and of course, then in their, in their actions, uh, this up, Building and we also that we had these well, intelligence information shared from the US and the UK and within NATO. So I think those those factors made this um, much more, I would say, bigger impact. And I mean the the the, the level of violence uh, that they have been. Well, been showing. Uh, we know that the threshold for violence was low, but but using this ultra well, violence uh, uh, has shocked everyone. And I think that is also why this has well, given such impact, uh, both in, in Sweden and in Finland. Thank you, Goran, for those reminders that a lot of the things that we're seeing now did not happen in a vacuum. Um, I'll turn to you, Yuka, and um, I, I, I think you have your sound issues sorted out so um, it's good let's to have hope you. so can you hear me now we can hear you so that's that's great um so um please go ahead if you would like me to just briefly repeat the question i'm i'm, I'm basically asking why is there this sudden surge in, in finland's uh approach to be part of nato why did it happen now not earlier and how significant is this sh shift thank you thank you very much leon and sorry for the problems with the audio and sorry also for the halo behind my head that's not intentional but uh, but just happens to be there and good to meet you Karin virtually uh, and, and I'm honored to be be invited to to talk in the, in this event um, yes I fully agree with you that the difference between February this year and then 2008 when Georgia happened and 2014 when when Crimea was invaded is remarkable 
Um, and I think when you look at the Finnish perception of NATO membership, we have been measuring that with polls since the 1990s. So we have a rather long time series of what the Finnish population thinks about military alignment or non-alignment. And the numbers had been very stable indeed, somewhere between 20, 25% of the population was in favor. Uh, there was uh, some politicians and, and some parties, our conservative party, uh, the, the most significant one who were openly for NATO membership, but um, all in all in, in the population and in the political field, uh, it, it was not a, an issue that, that was seriously discussed, so to speak. Um, then uh, um, uh, Georgia happened, as said, there was a little spike then, 2014, uh, with Crimea, another spike, but nothing major. But I think the, the present development actually started already before February this year. It started in, in November, December last year, when Russia quite clearly stated that they will not accept any NATO enlargement or uh, accession of new members to the alliance um, um, from now on. Uh, and re demanded that to be, be put into inter international agreements. And that to us was a clear um, uh, violation of our sovereignty to decide our own alignment and our own direction in the future. So that was the start. But then, then the real uh, big change was the, the aggression of Russia against the sovereign neighboring state, Ukraine, uh, and, and the scale of that attack, also the brutality of that attack, I think that led to, to the Finnish thinking changing fundamentally. And, and we saw that there had been a, a profound change in our security environment, in the security order of Europe. Um, and we saw no reason not to join NATO. I, I still think that, that more than, than um, concern or fear even of possible Russian action against Finland, that is a minor explainer in, in, in this situation. The, the real shift has been in the lack of trust towards Russia and, and sort of the trust that they would act reasonably and respect their international commitments and agreements. Thank you. Yes, that uh, makes sense to me also. Uh, Karen, uh, let's turn to you again. Uh, now, you've had uh, as Sweden, you've had various forms of cooperation with Russia in a variety of areas. Um, would you mind talking about some of those and how you think joining NATO will change that relationship with Russia? Thank you. Um, I would like to emphasize that from 2014, since 2014, our engagement with the official Russia has uh, has almost go down, gone down to zero. Uh, we shut down the, the military dialogue, we shut down, we have shut down most of the uh, well, of the cooperation. Uh, there are some few things left, we still speak with each, with each other in, in the OSC, we uh, speak with each other uh, when it comes to environmental issues um, in, the, in the Baltic region and regarding the Baltic Sea. Uh, and of course, there are some, we, I mean, from 2014, we really took down the level of, of engagement and, and on which level to meet. Uh, but then, of course, gradually, uh, from well, 2016, maybe, uh, the new government, they did have of course, some kind of exchange. You know that it changed over time. Uh, but um, I know that we also had quite good um, cooperation when it comes to, as I said, the Baltic Sea region and when it comes to security issues and search and rescues and so on. But I mean, the, the appetite in Sweden for this kind of cooperation has, has really gone down. Uh, it has been difficult to to really have a, a good cooperation, not with bearing in mind what, what has been happening. So I would say that the big shift when it comes to cooperation and interaction came already 2014, even if it, well, it gradually went a little bit well, better or more, and then it, it fell back in a way. But of course, it's, it, we, had, don't have a, we don't have a, a ground 
well, a border on the ground. We are close to Russia, but we have never, like, like Finland or or even Norway, we haven't had the, um, how can I say, that kind of of contact because we haven't, we were not forced to to have it, of course. Uh, so I think uh, um, that would uh, differ us a little bit, both from 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 our Nordic neighbors that we have always talked a lot about Russia, but we have not talked as much with Russia. Uh, and um, so that's why, well, I think that they see, they, they knew where to, well, to put us when it comes to security policy already in advance. In advance. So for us declaring now openly and, and having well, a broad political support for, for joining uh, the alliance, it really shouldn't come as a surprise to to the Russian leadership, uh, but of course they must be disappointed since their well way of of trying to uh, well, to stop NATO enlargement. While well, it has the opposite result. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I think we've given uh, Putin way too much credit for being a strategic thinker in that regard. Um, Yuka, let's turn to you while we talk about Russia. Uh, Finland shares a border of some 1,340 kilometers with Russia, which means that NATO's border with Russia will directly expand significantly should you join NATO. Um, how will Finland's NATO membership impact on NATO's defense and security? Thank you. Yes, indeed, we do have a 1,300 kilometer long land border with, with Russia. Um, it's worth noting that we have had that border for quite some time. Uh, it, it was the border of, of the then Swedish kingdom when we were part of, of Sweden for 600 centuries and, and the border moved uh, from one place to another. At times it was a peaceful border and, and there was transaction and trade happening across it and at times it, it was more more warlike uh, situation. Then when we were um, an autonomous grand duchy of the Russian Empire and I em want to um, emphasize the word autonomous because even though we were part of the em empire we had a very high degree of, of autonomy including uh, much of the Swedish le legislation that we retained even after being um, joined to, to uh, the, the Russian Empire. We also had our own currency, we had our own own postal service and importantly the border between mainland Russia and Finland was actually a customs border. So, so it, it existed even at that time. Then in the 20th century we had uh, good periods and worse periods. Of course the worst was not the Winter War 39-40 and then the continuation war against Soviet Union 41-44. Uh, but um, I think it's important to note that, that the border has not always been problematic and, and, and when things were better we were happy to quote uh, and to say that, that actually our border was the only border where Russia didn't have too many problems. Most of the other borders that they had were actually very difficult to control or, or then uh, caused other security problems for them. The, the Finnish border and the Norwegian border for that matter have been over the last decades rather, rather easy. Um, we also benefited both from cross-border trade, from tourism. Uh, St. Petersburg has the same population as a city, as the whole country of Finland. So, so you can imagine how important a market that was for many Finnish SMEs and, and, and companies and so forth. So, of course, this present situation means that, that we are going to lose economically quite a lot, as is, as is Russia going to lose. And this is just something ha we have to live with. But then to your question about uh, NATO membership, and of course we like to see ourselves as a security provider in, in Northern Europe and, and in the Baltic Sea region. We have quite credible defense forces that we have uh, upheld ever since the Second World War and also after the, the fall of the, the Soviet Union. Uh, Finland can call up to 280,000 uh, men and women into arms from, from the reserves. We have one of the largest art artilleries in Europe uh, in numbers and, and we also have been investing um, in uh, keeping up the, the capabilities that we have both in the Navy and, and in the Air Force. 
So I think what we would bring uh, is, is a very credible national defense that is able to defend the border if need be. Uh, and, and, and it's worth to be noted that, that there's very little discussion in Finland of whether we would want to have permanent NATO uh, troops from other member states present in the country because we don't really feel that we need them when, when things are as, as normal. But of course, it is important for us that, that we would be then able to receive help um, when when we need that. What we, else we bring, of course, we bring um, our very stable function in democracy um, and, and efficiency in decision making. And I think, or we like to think that, that the, the way we decided on the NATO membership is a good signal of that, how we had a very thorough parliamentary process in a, in a very short time um, and made sure that, that there is full support across the political spectrum for the membership before we actually signed the letter. And then, of course, we are, together with Sweden, we are democracies that are, are the most transparent um, and, um, uh, let's say, liberal in the world, which would also be, in a political sense, a good addition to NATO. And then finally, uh, not only in the military sense, but also in the civilian side, uh, we are both technologically quite advanced, so we would be able to bring uh, technological know-how, both in telecommunications, artificial intelligence, um, quantum computing, what have you, which I think are important factors for NATO as it is preparing to to answer to the new threats, not only the military threats. Thank you, Jukan, and I like what you said about um, Finland having that having had that border for a very very long time, which is of course an important point to keep keep uh, into consideration. I, I heard that the only time when uh, the Finnish smile is when you defend uh, your borders from Russian aggression. <laughs> so, um, okay, Karen, let's turn to you again. Um, what are the risks involved for Sweden in terms of uh, joining NATO and, and how will Sweden mitigate those risks? Well, thank you. And of course, that is one of the, the questions that you have or issues you have to take to, into account when you are prepared to change your well, security policy doctrine, even if we have been a very close partner uh, to, to NATO and we have well, uh, agreements and MOUs with uh, many countries, including the US. It is, of course, um, a sensitive period of time, especially when you're not covered by, by, um, by any really security guarantees. Uh, and I mean, that, that is quite a good, good proof of why we, we need uh, to be a part of this alliance, is that we want to be included. So we, we're, we're hoping for this now. But during the time, uh, well, uh, of course, we have to take responsibility for our own security. It doesn't matter if you're on your way in or you're on your way out, or you still have to have a credible uh, defense uh, capability. And we are already now, as you've seen, bolstering our defense budget, uh, going uh, for, for the target of 2% of, of GDP. And my party has also been advocating, and, and I, I would say pushing the current government uh, ahead of us uh, to be quicker. And of course, it's, it's a challenge to, to, to do a lot of investments in a short time, but we think it's, it's uh, absolutely necessary. So, so apart from that, uh, trying to strengthen our own defense, we have been, uh, as, as Finland as well, uh, well, have, we have, there has been dialogues, of course, with, uh, with a lot of the many, um, many members, many allies, to have uh, what you can call it security arrangements or agreements. We know that we cannot get or receive guarantees uh, in advance, uh, and we understand that fully there is a difference between being an ally and not being an ally. Uh, and I mean, even already since we became a member of 
the EU, uh, it's, I would like to underline that we haven't been neutral and we haven't been uh, non-aligned. We have been politically aligned. So there is the, the well, security declaration, as you know, and the, and the different clauses when it comes to security, but they are not as strong as, as being well, inside the club, inside the alliance and being covered by Article 5. Um, but I mean, basically, it's, it's having a dialogue, uh, be assured, and we have received, as I understand, um, not being in the middle of it, but uh, assurances that we can count on, on, on assistance uh, if needed. Uh, and also, of course, we, what we have seen now, what we, have, what, what we think is that um, um, we, can, we could be, uh, how can I say, subject for especially cyber threats and that kind of attacks. Um, that is what we foresee, but I mean, we cannot rule out any kind of answer. Uh, but that is so, so to be prepared and also prepared, of course, for less information, uh, different kinds of events and campaigns that could delay or, I don't know, make our vision blurry, uh, trying to, uh, well, with conspiracy theories and so on, saying that, oh, why don't, why don't you do it like this or that? I've heard that um, some people uh, from, from Russian authorities were, were very concerned about the, the democratic value of, our, of, the, of the decision in Sweden, that we should really have a referendum. Wouldn't that be the best, uh, the best way of doing it? That's quite ironic, I would say, to, to use that kind of democratic uh, criticism towards us. Such, that's, well, I took too long, so I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. Now, I've been very impressed with the reports coming from both uh, Stockholm and Helsinki government reports laying out the problem and, and the st steps forward. And as you mentioned, the, the key issue that uh, that have been that that has been highlighted by both of your governments has been the issue of Article Five. You're either in the club or you're not, despite the importance of these defense declarations that we're seeing right now. Um, so, Yuka, you are welcome to add on to uh, those points in terms of what preparations Finland is making, but I'll, I'll ask you an, an additional question, maybe, um, if we want to pivot away from that. What is the time scale in terms of joining NATO for Finland at this point, and, and how will joining NATO alter your defense budget and how it is allocated? Thank you. Um, on the previous question and, and the points that Karin made, I have actually very little to add, except to say that, that of course, we have been prepared for decades for many sorts of issues that might show up. And, and we have been building ever since the 1950s a, a, a concept of comprehensive security in the society, meaning that, that for us being prepared is not only defense, it, it's, the, it's a whole of society approach where we uh, train um, uh, uh, together with the public sector, with defense, with different ministries, but also with the, with the rescue services, with the health services, with schools, even private companies. And being a country of 5.5 million people, we can do that because most of the key decision makers, be they private or public sector, know each other um, and they are prepared for then cooperating in, in a crisis situation if the need be. In addition to that, uh, the security of supply tradition in, in Finland is very strong. We have had um, uh, key elements of, of um, making sure that the society runs um, looked after. Um, and, and we are, of course, now uh, making sure that, that all parts of, of that machinery are well in place should we run into difficulties with, with supply lines or uh, indeed energy supply. And on energy, I just want to say that, that Finland has been diversifying its energy mix for, for many years, moving towards renewables and clean energy from the fossil fuels. We did uh, import both electricity and gas and coal and oil from Russia, but all of those are now drying up and, and we are finding 
other um, solutions to to replace them and, and on electricity especially specifically which which russia cut some days ago um, that that uh, deficit has been filled by by swedish um, um, uh, sources we have a very well functioning nordic electricity pool in um, uh, in the nordic countries um, then what has happened to Finnish defense spending? Um, we are now pretty much at 2% of GDP because of the um, acquisitions that we have already in the pipeline. We are renewing the, the, the Navy, as I said, with, with uh, new vessels that are built in Finland. We have also concluded the, the process of, of replacing or ordering new replacements for our fighter planes last year. In December, we made the decision of, of ordering 64 new F-35s, replacing the old F-18s. Uh, and that will automatically almost mean that, that our GDP share of defense will go up to 2.5% in the, in the next couple of years. And then probably returning close to 2%. But I think Finland, in this context and in all the, all the organizations that we join, we are quite uh, strict on on um, uh, following what has been commonly agreed and as in NATO the two percent target is very clear I am certain that also the future governments of Finland would make sure that the defense spending stays on that level uh, I would also like to point out here in relation to the cost that that since we have a conscription system um, the economic cost of having almost the whole generation in military training for periods of up, up to six to 12 months um, uh, of their uh, efficient working career is actually not calculated in the 2%. So if you would count that in the, the, the uh, share of, of, of defense spending would be even higher. Thank you for that overview. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that with Sweden, the figures would be uh, similar. I, I did read in the reports how your um, budgets will increase quite significantly. And there's also uh, allocations towards staff, additional staff that will be deployed to NATO and other areas. Um, but um, let's talk a little bit about how uh, Sweden and Finland's NATO membership will alter Arctic security. I know that, that before this February escalation, of course, um, we were talking about NATO 2030, the, the, the agenda and, uh, uh, and how climate change is important. And, and there were several references also made to the Arctic by some of the participants um, who joined in uh, on, on, you know, on the, in terms of this discussion. Um, so, Karin, I would be very interested to hear what your take is um, with regards to Arctic security. Thank you, and it's a really an important uh, issue. And I think um, in the past that Sweden, as not being a coastal nation up to the, to the Arctic Sea, we have been a little bit, I wouldn't say passive, that's the wrong word, but maybe a little bit um, shy. Uh, not always be biting into to it. Uh, and in the past, it also has been said that in the Arctic Council, we should leave security, I mean, yes, military security, that kind of security outside of the Arctic Council. But I think this, it, I think, unfortunately, in a way, we have to change that since we have nations uh, not prepared or not letting us having it outside of the of the council unfortunately not uh, and with both both uh, Finland and Sweden uh, becoming um, becoming members it will of course shift or change a little bit the dynamics within the Arctic Council uh, so I think we really have a, an opportunity here to take what well, I would say to be more forward leaning uh, and to take more initiatives and work together with the other states, uh, other nations uh, within the council, it's quite obvious that we we need to to go uh, or work well with, with really a, a full scale or, or the whole scope of what kind of challenges we see 
in the Arctic uh, area, since we know that, as you say, climate change will affect uh, the, the, near, the nearer you come to the, to the poles, the effects will be larger. So that will affect us whether we like it or not. And, and then how to, to cooperate and how to work together to, to mitigate the risks, to try to, to re-stabilize and make this, uh, this area uh, a stable, uh, uh, well, not high tension, but then low tension uh, in security wise. But it's, uh, it's gonna be tough, of course, but uh, I hope that we can work together with all the nations, but we have a special relationship with Finland and uh, I think we can, can work together. And I don't know if we're gonna get into this, but then I would like to make some comments about how we can also, I would say, have a reinvention of the, both the Nordic cooperation and the Nordic Baltic cooperation within the Alliance, but I can come back to that later. Thank you. Yeah, definitely an interesting issue that we can pick up on. Um, so feel free to weave it into your um, your next comments also. Um, let, let me maybe just give a chance to you, perhaps, while we're talking about maritime security also. Um, Finland owns, of course, the Poland Islands, an autonomous region that lies at the entrance to uh, the Gulf of Botnia in the Baltic Sea between Finland and Sweden. Now, at present, it's, it's a neutral and demilitarized zone. Can you explain to us the significance of the islands and how joining NATO may impact on them? Thank you. Thank you. I'll be happy to. But let me add a couple of things to, to what Karin said about uh, the Arctic area first. And I fully share her, her views also, especially on the Arctic Council and, and, and the, the tendency and, and the attempt to keep hard security questions out of the agenda of the Council. But of course, it is um, evident that the strategic importance of the Arctic will grow with climate change when the, when the ice sheet uh, will diminish. Uh, but we also should keep in mind that, that it is not exactly around the corner. Um, the, the northeastern route uh, from Europe to Asia will eventually open for commercial um, or economically viable commercial transport as well. But uh, even if the ice is gone, the, the waters will be extremely challenging to navigate. It will require a, a huge or large infrastructure in, uh, investments to be sure that, that uh, it can be uh, safe and secure. And then uh, the route will go through Russian um, um, territorial waters or economic zone also in the future. And then when it comes to the, the natural resources in the Arctic, uh, much of emphasis was put a couple of years or decades ago to the uh, oil and gas um, reserves uh, underneath the ice, but, but their exploration or their usage has, has become uh, so, or it, it is so expensive that at, at the moment, even with these prices, it is not viable to, to see that, that there would be a huge race for, for those resources. So clearly, uh, there is uh, military strategic importance in the Arctic, and the Chinese also are very interested in that area, and the Russians, of course, are keeping an eye on that as well. So it's a complex geopolitical game. Um, but I think, as I said in the beginning, our membership and Sweden's membership in NATO will increase security in the north, not, not decrease it uh, from, from our point of view. Then on the Åland Islands, yes, you're right. Uh, they are a demilitarized zone, and that history goes back actually further than independent Finland. The first agreement on that was made already during the 19th century and, and, and the Great Britain happens to be one of the guarantors of, of that uh, treaty alongside with Russia and, and, and others. Um, and what it means in practice is that, that Finland has a duty to defend the Orland Islands, but we are not allowed or we cannot keep or under normal, normal circumstances military um, installments or military personnel on, on the islands. And the Orlanders, who are um, not very numerous, but, but uh, still very vocal, I would say, keep a close eye on this. So, so this is sort of, they are making sure that, that the um, non-aligned status uh, uh, stays, which of course they have the full right to do. Um, I don't think that Finland's NATO membership will change uh, the, the, the position of all islands in, in a significant way. The, the treaty, old treaty stays in place. But of course, again, in a situation where we do need to defend the islands, then we would 
could have help of, from both Sweden and, and other NATO members if, if that need did arise. Thank you. Um, now, you mentioned China, and we do have a China question here from one of our audience members, my colleague Hugo Jones from LSE Ideas. He's asking, uh, does further NATO expansion risk consolidating the China-Russia friendship through creating a shared threat perception? And what could be done to prevent or mitigate this? So maybe you, could, just because you mentioned China earlier, I'll, I'll throw that question to you and I'll, I'll uh, yeah, thank you. Friendship is always a bit loaded word when it comes to interstate or inter intercountry relationship, I think. But but certainly China and Russia have shared interests. Um, uh, and at the moment, we see that, that China is, is um, let's say, balancing itself on how to react to the war in Ukraine and how to deal with the situation that has arisen. And, and, and certainly they are keeping a clo close eye on on the Russia, Europe and Russia West relationship and, and, and what that would mean for them. I think from Moscow's point of view, um, it is evident that the China's importance will grow. Um, um, they are already now economically a giant compared to Russia. They also have um, uh, sectors of their economy that are much more advanced uh, than, than Russia is. Um, in the military side, Russia might still have some technologies that are in, of interest to Russia, but I think even that gap is, is quickly uh, diminishing as, as, as China advances. And of course, China is investing in, in their defense cap capabilities more than, more than anyone else uh, at the moment and, and, and building a lot of, of ships and, and other capabilities that the Russians must be keeping an eye on. So I would say that the current situation is sort of a um, um, a partnership that makes sense um, because of a, of a common adversary, if you wish, but whether that will last and who will then be the dominant partner in that partnership um, uh, is, is an interesting question to follow. Russia has the benefits of having the nuclear arsenal, but I would say that is almost the only benefit that they have but when, when, in, when comparing with, with China. Thank you. Um now, let's go back to Karan. Uh, we have a question here from Robert from Swansea University, and he is uh, alluding to uh, some of the, the position, at least, that uh, President Erdogan from Turkey is taking about blocking potential membership uh, for, for Sweden and Finland. Um, how do you uh, plan to go about ironing out this issue with Turkey? Thank you. And that is, of course, a, a very, it's a sensitive and, and difficult uh, question. Uh, it wasn't raised, uh, well, before it came up very, very late uh, in this process. Uh, we have had, well, received signals that there was, well, this w was not going to be an issue. So, of course, you should... Maybe never be surprised. You don't know what's going to happen when when you do something like that, like we like we have done. Uh, so, uh, so I must say, I think I let I let the well, the government uh, and the, um, try to sort this out on on, on the highest level instead of uh, filling this or trying to load this issue with with more than it is. Um, I, I can see I'm following the dialogue uh, uh, on, on the high level. And of course, I think that, um, that also the, but that's not for me to say, but of course, I hope that other uh, NATO allies uh, in a strong way, see what we have seen, they are supporting our application and our, uh, well, us becoming members. So I, I hope these two things, the pressure from other allies and a dialogue between, between, um, between uh, Sweden and Turkey will solve this out. So that's really, I'm not prepared. I think, I don't think that I can solve this myself. Uh, and I don't think it will, will help too much to go too deep into this uh, issue. Of course, it's a sensitive issue because NATO requires um, 
unanimous decision. So I, I can imagine it weighs both on, on uh, you know, for, for both of your countries um, quite heavily on your shoulders. Um, Yuka, perhaps, uh, would you like to comment about the upcoming NATO summit in Madrid? It's my understanding that both Finland and Sweden will partake in that summit. Do you yet have a sense of um, uh, what, you know, how your participation will be, uh, what would look like? I mean, my Madrid conference is quite significant exactly because NATO is dealing, um, developing the new strategic concept, of course. So um, it's, it's, it's quite a significant moment to be there. So I don't know if you could comment for us on, on, on the summit, perhaps. Well, certainly we look forward to participating in the summit, but it's up to the member states to invite us. But uh, that, that is the understanding, or let's say that was the understanding uh, a couple of weeks ago when and, and, and I didn't answer your question about the about the, the um, process and how we expect that to go forward. We were thinking that uh, by the summit we would have had the, the uh, sort of technical procedures in, in uh, in um, Brussels already behind us with the accession negotiations and, and then the, the decision in the NATO Council of opening opening the ratification process. But let's see whether we can get that done before the summit. Um, and as you said, uh, it, there are important issues on the table uh, besides Sweden's and NATO's, uh, Sweden and Finland's me membership. So the st strategic concept definitely is one of them. And of course, we will, um, uh, we have followed its its development and I look forward to being able to sit around the table and, and, and contribute to that as well. Um, uh, it is sort of perhaps not necessary to load too many expectations for the, for the summit now. Of course, there will probably be statements from individual member states related to our, our future memberships in that uh, context and, and whether she, whether a, a joint text that then can be agreed with between all the members that remains to be seen. We were like Sweden surprised by Turkey's comments because that's, that was not the message that we were getting before sending in the application, but we are quite prepared and actually already in the process of sitting down with them and, and getting through the, the issues that they have and, and, and discussing that in the transparent and open manner that we always deal with with any international organization. So, so we certainly take the view that, that uh, if we are or when we are looking to join a defensive alliance, we take all the member states' uh, security concerns seriously and are willing uh, to listen and, and for our part to see what we can do to, to um, uh, lessen those, those concerns. Thank you. Corin, I don't know if you want to jump in also to give your perspective on how important you think it is for Sweden and Finland to be part of that discussion in Madrid and, and to what extent perhaps or what, what would it mean to you? Well, of course, we would be delighted to be invited. And I mean, we have been invited to, to um, to summits uh, in the past and it has been very useful for us we have been invited as at partners as partners uh, but as the the ambassador, the ambassador said as we don't know exactly in which capacity maybe um, i think we we are we are ready to participate in in the way that uh, the the member states would like us to participate and there are um, very important issues on the table. Uh, we've been from from the our parliamentary delegation in the Swedish Parliament, and I am sure that our Finnish counterparts has done the same. Uh, from the parliamentary assembly view, we've been trying to well, to follow also the the development of of the strategic concept, and I think there are a lot of very interesting issues in in this, and, and we are always willing to both listen and to contribute to the debate. But uh, as said, we, we, are, we are not exactly where we, would, we thought maybe we would be at this time. But um, I mean, this is a process and we have, uh, of course, uh, a lot of respect for, for, for the, all the member states and their views. Thank you. 
Um, let me ask you uh, another question for my colleague, Julia Rang at LSE Ideas. She's asking, uh, how does Sweden and Finland plan to tackle anti-NATO sentiments domestically and in other NATO member states? These sentiments have particularly come to light during the recent French presidential election. Maybe, maybe, Colin, because I, I know that with your recent government uh, uh, document report that was published, um, there were also some annexes to explain that there were different positions within Sweden from some of the political parties. Perhaps you can just say a sentence or two yeah. about how this application is perceived, um, you know, among some of the other parties. Where are the big areas of difference? Thank you for that. Well, sh shortly you can say that it's the left party and the green party. They are not in favor of, of our application and our membership. And um, I think it, it has both has to do with, with history and tradition, but also they think this has happened too fast. Uh, and there is, of course, a, a fear of um, um, and a reluctancy when it comes to well, to, to be very frank, when it comes to nuclear, nuclear arms, uh, I would say that they, maybe they, maybe they, I would say that they are naive, but we know it for a fact. It's, it's, um, it's, we know that we, are, we have been covered and, and it has been good for us to be uh, more or less under the nuclear umbrella and under this, well, the, we have, Benefit from the, benefited from that uh, from, for many years, um, um, even if it hasn't been uh, said out loud. Uh, but that is one big concern. Of course, we have to be serious about that when it comes to nuclear arms, uh, both as, as a doctrine, as a concept, but also a fear of, well, should they be stationed in, in, in Sweden? Um, and also, of course, a uh, uh, fear of, not being able to be as independent, be this independent voice when it comes to, to foreign affairs, uh, and being able to, to say and do almost whatever you would like to say uh, and be a, well, a broker when it comes to well, peace meddling and so on. But so that is the, I mean, the main arguments um, against. Uh, and there is, um, it's not a strong, not, I wouldn't say it's a strong feeling, but, but of course there are some kind of strokes of, of anti-Americanism uh, in this, but it's, that is, I wouldn't say that that is mirrored uh, among a broader public. I would say the public support is now strong. Uh, and it's only two parties uh, who are against, uh, and at least the Green Party, they ex say that they will accept if this is... Um, this is, has now started no matter what happens in, in the election, but they understand that you cannot turn the clock back. So they will not protest or try to, to take, take us out of the organization. Uh, they say that they will work from inside. So I think that is quite a mature uh, point of view from a party which is not in favor of the membership as such. And what are the um, the uh, arguments against NATO membership in relation to the nuclear issue, and what are the counter arguments to that? Perhaps I think this it's the general concept of uh, well, dreaming and hoping for a, a world without nuclear arms, uh, and then we try to say that well, that would be wonderful, uh, but uh, it could just be democracies who, 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 will, <laughs> who will disarm and take them away because we have uh, other very strong, uh, strong forces uh, who are not most nations, which are not democracies and they will not take this seriously. So as long as we have a imbalance between, uh, between nations with and nuclear arms then also democracies and friends need to have them. And I think that is the, the easiest way to explain it. But of course, uh, if they were not needed, we, sh we shouldn't, they shouldn't exist. 
but we have to balance uh, uh, other nations uh, who are possessing these uh, these dreadful weapons. Can I, Leon, say a couple of words about the anti-NATO sentiments as well? Because I think it's yes, very important. Please, please do. Important point. And, 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 and from in, in the Finnish discussion, um, of course, at the moment, we don't have any concerns about that because in, in the parliament, we had 188 out of 200 voted for the membership. Uh, and the polls are quite clear that the, the general population is for that as well. But I, I would take the Finnish EU membership as an example here, because when we joined and we had a referendum uh, on joining the EU in 1994. The, the vote was not that um, uh, clear in a sense. It was 54, 46 for joining. But since then, uh, once we were in, the popularity of NATO uh, EU grew. And actually, it is larger now than it was when we joined. And also, the popularity of Euro is, is larger than it was. And actually, the Euro is more popular than the EU, which is a bit bizarre, but, but still, that is the way it is. So I think the Finns take a very um, pragmatic view on this, that when once we go in somewhere, we are there 100% and, and we take it seriously and we don't look back. Um, this has been the, the case with all our uh, memberships so far. I don't think we have left any, any international organizations during our our existence and, and we we put a very heavy emphasis on on being present at the tables where decisions are about made about us and of course nato table is one of those to to a very great extent well i'm personally excited about uh the prospect of both of your nations joining nato uh so but i might be a little biased um let me ask you another question, Yukan. Thank you for, for uh, addressing those issues also. I wasn't going to ask you something about domestic politics, but I think it's quite uh, what you mentioned about uh, sentiments with regards to NATO that, that has really just sparked um, increasingly over the last few years in Finland. But um, let me ask you this question. How important is it for Finland and Sweden to join NATO together at this point? If I can go first, Karin, I think for yeah. us, uh, it is it is clear that we started on this path together um, uh, and we were very happy that, that Sweden could move as fast as they could. Maybe all, all of my countrymen didn't believe that that would happen and maybe all of Karen, Karin's countrymen didn't believe it either. But now we are here and, and we presented the letters together and I think from the Finnish standpoint, we, we go together um, uh, until we see what the end result is. Indeed, um, I think it's uh, since we have been um, deepening our cooperation, we have uh, uh, we are so close to each other, and to do this hand in hand is is uh, the, the the best way to do it. And we also know that maybe the the window of, of opportunity here may not be open and um, uh, endless, endlessly. Uh, and I also think that when when you make the decision. You must be be firm and swift in, in a way, and uh, it feels it's very, I would say, secure and, and, uh, and reassuring that we do this together. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense in so many ways. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when it comes to our defense cooperation, but also to, as I said, the Nordic defense cooperation and the Nordic Baltic different uh, defense cooperation. Because I mean, I've been really advocating both. Uh, uh, Finnish Swedish cooperation, but also uh, in the Nordic sense. But as I've said so many times, I don't know how, in how many conferences and debates saying that, well, we cannot reach our full potential when it comes to Nordic cooperation until we have the same kind of security policy or sec affiliation to the same uh, organization uh, that is uh, the Alliance uh, NATO. So so it's important and I think uh, it gives, well, I think it, it makes us better as a team as well to, to, to contri contribute to the alliance with, uh, with the package of two. Thank you. Um, no, we appreciate your strong alliance, of course. I'm, I'm very happy that both of you were on this um, panel together. I'll, I'll give each of you just 30 seconds, just final Final words, final thoughts, uh, any messages you have uh, to, to other members of NATO member states. Um, so let's start with uh, you, Yuka, and then we'll go to Karin. 
Thank you. I'll take inspiration of one of the questions we didn't have time to answer, which was at the Q&A, which had to do with OSCE. Mm. And I think it is important that once we get over this, this phase uh, in our security alignment history is that, that we go back to the um, structures and, 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 and systems we have in Europe and, and we try to make sure that nothing like um, um, Ukraine ever happens again. And there we need yet another uh, ne negotiation process. We have put up uh, our candidacy for, or actually been already accepted as, as OSCE chairman in 25, and certainly we will continue that work that will has become remarkably more difficult over the past, past couple of months. But we haven't, mustn't forget that uh, we have to build a common future together in Europe, and that has to be done in, in some framework, and, and to me, a better framework than OSCE doesn't exist. Thank you. Karen? Well, I would like to, to thank you for arranging this seminar and I would like to well, invite people who, who are interesting, interested or have, have uh, I mean, specific questions on what will this mean or what is the, the situation in Sweden to, to come back um, uh, to me or to other Swedish representatives, of course, and that I'm really looking forward now to, to interact with with all the all the, the parliamentarians, all the MPs uh, from from NATO allies and then the NATO member states to to be as open as possible and show us that we are not just asking for things or for security. We are also we are ready to offer uh, our assistance, our help, our support to to do this together for for a better future. Not just only for NATO, but as uh, the ambassador said, for for Europe and of course for for the rest of the world as well. But our area of responsibility is in this part. But we have to be able to to continue to have um, to have cooperation and to have dialogue. Um, that's the way. Sometimes you have to be tough, but you also have to uh, have an open uh, an open channel with with the, all of the nations. Uh, in our part of the world. Of course, thank you. Thank you to both of you for being part of this uh, discussion. We're all uh, following your, your membership process uh, quite closely. Hopefully we can get you back to our dialogues at some point in the future uh, as NATO member states also, uh, uh, so that you'll, you'll also uh, be, be part of the club, be part of uh, Article 5, be protected by it. Um, thank you also for, for uh, what, what you've been doing also in support of uh, Ukraine also in this, in this conflict. And um, uh, next week, I just want to remind our audience that we will come back to the Russia-Ukraine dialogues where we will be discussing uh, the future of NATO and European security. Thank you to our guests for tuning in and uh, to our panelists and see you all next Tuesday. Thank you. Bye.